So I have a question to pose this morning. An extremely relevant question. Very simple. Are you happy? Are you happy? I've been leading our church family through a series of messages entitled, Ten Choices That Will Change Your Life for Good. And they've been very well received because they are so relevant to our life. Ten choices that will change our, our life for good. And we are at number eight today. The choice to be happy. If you ask the average person what it is they want for their life, or if you ask a parent what it is they want for their children, consistently they will say, to be happy. And the founders of America understood that. They scripted the American Constitution to provide the rights of Americans to pursue happiness. <coughs> but what is it? What is it we're pursuing? Happiness. I really thought about that. Used Webster's, and a lot of reflection. Happiness is, is equated with inner contentment. Inner contentment. It's a deep satisfaction with life. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, Paul writes, But godliness with contentment is great gain. If you can find happiness while serving the Lord, oh, you've got it made. Should the followers of Jesus pursue happiness? Yes! <laughs> Are you supposed to be miserable? Oh, I wish I could be miserable. I'm way too happy. Of course you're supposed to pursue happiness. When the scriptures say, Blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, who, who, who stands in the way of the sinner, or sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and in it does he meditate both day and night, that he might be like a tree planted by water. The word blessed, blessed is the person, means happy, happy. It's supposed to, when Jesus said, blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed, he's, he's saying, I want you to be happy. Does God want you to be happy? <clears throat> of course God wants you to be happy. Jesus spoke of, of, of our life being abundant, of, of being packed full of joy, his joy being imparted to us and, and, it, and it taking hold of us. Of course there will be seasons of sadness in your life. You can't lose someone you love and not feel sad. That's normal. But as a general rule, happiness will prevail. At least this is God's desire for you. The music industry gives us, gives us some hints how, how we can find this happiness. Bobby McFerrin kind of suggested it's kind of mind over matter. Don't worry, be happy. Here's a little song I wrote. I hope you sing it note for note. You notice I'm not singing it? Because I want you to be happy. Don't worry. Be happy. Jimmy Soul. How many of you know him? He advised all men in this world on how to find happiness. He wrote and he sang, If you want to be happy for the rest of your life, never make a pretty woman your wife. <laughs> so from my personal point of view, get an ugly girl to marry you. You're going, are you serious, Pastor? Well, that's what he said. Marketing. Coke advertises open happiness. There's been some days I've been really thirsty and really appreciated a nice Coke, but the happiness doesn't seem to last on that basis alone. How about you? Adidas marketed their shoes as the recipe for happiness. I remember when I was 12, getting my first pair of Adidas shoes. I was happy. I don't know where they are now, though. <laughs> lost. My heart tells me that all this advice is somewhat flawed. Our culture, through marketing programs, conditions us with the message that wealth and stuff is the pathway to happiness. And I think we've all fallen prey to this message along the way. No matter 
We'll, we'll call it the hedonic treadmill. Well, we won't call it. It's been called that. The hedonic treadmill. That is, in your pursuit of that carrot, in pursuit of, of wealth and, and stuff to, that you think will make you happen, happy, no matter how much you have, you always want more. Why? Because what you have isn't enough. Have we ever stopped to ask the question, does wealth and possessions really lead to happiness? The answer is both yes and no. The idea that happiness can be achieved through wealth and accumulation is based on both the truth and a lie. I really want you to think about this. Tom Hartman puts it this way. Imagine you were naked and alone, outdoors in a forest, on a cold and yet rainy <coughs> night. It's not hard to imagine that you were unhappy in those circumstances. But you find a cabin, and someone opens the door and invites you in, offers you, some, offers you a blanket and says, here's a fire that you can sit next to and some food to eat. It's not hard to see that with that little stuff, that provision, you quickly go from being unhappy to being happy. The right stuff made the difference. Stuff made you happy. It's true. However, if this stuff, much stuff made you happy, you might conclude that ten times as much stuff would make you ten times happier. Or a thousand times as much stuff would make you a thousand times happier. In other words, Bill Gates lives in a state of psychological bliss. But it's not true. See, that part's the lie. When, mo when money buys you out of homelessness and secures your next meal, it changes your level of happiness. But once you have your basic needs met, money or stuff does not buy you more happiness. And that's where we lose our way. We've been fed a lie and we took it. Over the last 50 years economic growth has skyrocketed. We are two times wealthier but the average person is not happier. They're certainly not twice as happy. Mom, I've seen pictures back 50 years ago when I was born. We have more than twice as much stuff. But are we twice as much happy? Truth? We're less happy. Does God want us to be happy? Of course He does. We're to pray for our daily bread. We're to pray for our basic needs to be met. 1 Timothy 6, 8, but we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. There's a happiness in that. God promises to meet our needs. God wants us to be happy. But does God want us to be rich? Well, that's a different kind of question. I don't like where this message is going, Pastor. <clears throat> well, what, helping wealth is not forbidden in scriptures, but Jesus said, certainly harder. I mean, think of a camel going through an eye of a needle. And that's how hard it is for a rich person to get into heaven. And it makes sense, the temptation to want more and to keep it all for yourself, it's extremely high, especially in our consumer-driven culture. Jesus said, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their soul? So think about this in your quest to be happy. There's a law of nature that many of us are breaking every day. And it's this, that nothing takes more in nature than it really needs. The lion only kills one gazelle in order to satisfy its need. The redwood tree does not take all the nutrients, it only takes what it needs. And if something breaks that law in nature, it usually dies off. 
And we have a term for something in our bodies that takes more than its share. We call it cancer. We hear of many problems in this world. Hunger, violence, depression. Is there a poison underneath the surface? Is there a problem that's feeding all the other problems? And Jesus said this, <coughs> the love of money is the root of all evil. Do you know when the Europeans came to the Americas and they met the Aboriginal peoples? The Aboriginal First Nation peoples called the white man cannibals. Not because they ate flesh, they called them spiritual cannibals because they ate the life of others in order to advance themselves. And as they observed the white man taking property more than they needed, they said the white man suffered from mental illness. Maybe they were right. More and more we live in a consumer, not, we live as consumers, not citizens. Maybe even the Western world is insane. Certainly a, lot, a large part of this world thinks that we are. And they hate America. I, I'll be honest with you, I struggle with rationalizing my comfortable life as I look at pictures and meet people from third world countries. I struggle. We are rich Christians in an age of hunger. We are. And it might be just the life that we are trying to win at is also at the same time destroying us. While the U.S. Constitution protects the pursuit of happiness, Benjamin Franklin said that very few catch it. And they don't catch it because they're chasing for happiness in the wrong way. Because nothing that we grasp seems to give us happiness for, for any longevity. And, and as we look around, there's an epidemic of unhappiness. The American dream has been based on a lie, and, and so the dream has become, in many ways, a nightmare. So does God want us to be rich and accumulate more? Well, I don't like that question. And neither do you. But not only is accumulation and hoarding not the way to happiness. What we learn is that it actually opposes it. It works against it. We might, in fact, be wrecking our own lives. C.K. Chesterton was once asked, what is wrong with this world? And he answered, I am. But what if the question was different? What if the question was, what is right with this world? What is right with this world? Could we answer, I am. Because maybe we could change, or maybe we could be the change, rather, that we want to see. Maybe we could make a decision to be happy. And in keeping with that, we could make decisions to have a healthy relationship with wealth, with possessions. Maybe we could make a choice that would change our life for good. Because you want to be happy, don't you? And if Jesus is God in the flesh, and what he said is true, then we've been going about it the right, wrong way, and we need to go about it the way that he laid out. Paul wrote to the Romans, telling them not to be squeezed into the thinking of this world and its values. If we're to find personal happiness, we must learn to think differently. If you read the scriptures, Jesus turned everything inside out. He said, if you want to be great, you've got to be the least. If you want to... Um, if you want to be first, you've got to be last. The way to, to, to receive is actually to give. Everything was backwards according to the values of the world. But I'd like you to imagine that you're a billionaire. I know you have to imagine that. And if you don't have to imagine that, I'd like to talk to you after the service. I've got some ideas. But I'd like you to imagine that you're a billionaire. And you have in your wallet three $50 bills. And you're out for dinner and you decide to leave for a tip one $50 bill. And so you stick it under your plate for the waitress. Very kind. 
Later in the day, you look at your wallet and you realize there's only one $50 bill there. Well, you knew you had three. So what are two things that have happened? One is you've lost it or else you mistakenly put two $50 bills under the plate. Are you with me? What are you going to do? Are you going to get all upset? Are you going to go back to the restaurant and try to retrieve the second 50? Of course not. You're going to shrug it off. Why? You're a billionaire. $50 doesn't make a difference. You lost 50, so what? You're too rich to be concerned with that kind of loss. And so, here we sit. We would like to go out and buy a brand new vehicle. Maybe we'd even like to go out and buy a brand new home. But you can't, you can't afford that. You can't even afford new clothing. Don't tell me, but I know some of you shop at Salvation Army or Value Village. Does that limitation disrupt your contentment with life? Do you shake your fist at God? Do you toss and turn at night? Are you upset with the fact that you can't get what you think are the best things in life? If you do, I submit it's because you truly don't know how rich that you are. You don't know who you are in Christ. You've lost touch with your identity. As a Christian, you are a spiritual billionaire. Say that with me. I'm a billionaire. Come on. You're a billionaire. In Christ, you're a billionaire. Spiritual billionaire. And you're wringing your hands over something that has no real bearing on happiness. Think about it. Because those, those things won't give you happiness. Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. And so it's time that we decided what our treasure ought to be and live accordingly. Now the Sea of Galilee in Israel and the Dead Sea are very different from each other. The Sea of Galilee receives water from Mount Hermon and flows down and the Sea of Galilee gives out. And if you look at the Sea of Galilee, you stand by it, it's teeming with life. It's vibrant, it's full, it's colorful. The Dead Sea, however, receives, but there's no outlet. It's stale. It's stagnant. It's dead. And this is a metaphor for happiness. You can choose to be the Sea of Galilee. You choose to be a conduit. And if so, as you receive, you give, you will find what you're looking for. Happiness. Now there are many ways that you can give of yourself. In your quest to be happy, you must start by pulling out the root of all evil. You must break the power of the love of money in your life. Businessmen, farmers, Instead of measuring profits by simply dollars earned, you could integrate into your business model a different kind of profitability. That is, how is your business contributing to your neighbors, your community, and the world? I know some farmers that they have, they've actually defined their business as farming with a difference. They earn not to keep, but to give it away. And they call it growing with a difference or growing change. On the level of our personal finances, why are we so concerned about our retirements and living in comfort? Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said, did you catch that? Don't be concerned about tomorrow, but be concerned about today, for today is enough for you to be concerned about. What is right with the world? You could be what's right with the world by making a decision to be happy. But to do that, you must loosen your grip on wealth and possessions because wealth and possessions actually work against your deepest desire to be happy. I know this is countercultural, but that was Jesus. 
and you know within it's the truth. Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content with whatever circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. And I have learned the secret of being content in every situation, whether fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do all this through Him who gives me strength. What is the secret of contentment? What is the secret of contentment? Don't ask Oprah. She's loaded. Don't ask Bill Gates. They're loaded, and they want more. Oh, Oprah gives some away. How much is she giving away? Come on now. The secret of contentment is not measured with wealth and accumulation. God wants you to be happy. He says He will meet your basic needs. You can be content. The measure of happiness is found in your generosity beyond your needs being. In order to break the power of mammon or money in our life, God said, here's what I want you to do. Not my instruction. The first tenth goes to God. You give it back to God before anything else. You give it to the place where you're spiritually fed. You, go, you give it to some place in the kingdom where it's going to make a difference. You meet the basic needs of your family. How foolish it is to give it away when your own kids or your own family are doing without. You meet the needs of your family. So you give to God, you meet the needs of your family, but after that our focus should not be on what we don't have, but on what we have to share. So the Bible talks about in the book of Malachi and throughout the scriptures about giving offerings. As the Holy Spirit leads you, you give to whatever and whom. You spend your life on serving others not yourself. We have a rule in our home, and we're doing it again, if you're not using it, lose it. <clears throat> might have value, but if you don't use it, lose it. We take it over to the Salvation Army or to somewhere else where it can benefit another family. What have you been doing, and we're mindful of this during the Advent season, but all year, to meet the needs of the community? There are real needs out there, hungry families, in fact, you can make this a habit. You can make happiness a habit. Random acts of kindness every day. Get up and, and look for someone. Look for somewhere where you can surprise someone with an act of kindness. Now you're talking about what makes a person happy. The happiest people you will find are, the lo are those that give what they have away. First you make your decisions, and then your decisions make you. This is a choice that will change your life for good. You can keep on doing it the way you've been doing it, or you can make a dramatic shift in your life, and you can say, you know what? I've been blessed beyond measure. It's time for me to share that measure with others. Why should we live this way? Number one, because it is the way to happiness. And number two, God says, I have nobody else but you. Heavenly Father, we do not like to hear messages that threaten our perceived comfort. And yet we know that the world we've created can be taken away in blood. What you've really called us to is to an uns unselfish kind of living. Where we live not for ourselves, but we live for others. And in so doing, we're living for you. Help us, God, to be generous. To be ridiculously generous. And may joy and happiness rise up in each one of us. And everyone said, Amen. Amen.